and welcome to today's webinar. It's the second in our series 16 of American English Live Teacher Development Webinars. We're so excited that each of you are here with us today. My name is Kate and I'll be with you today along with my colleague behind the scenes, Heather, who will be the moderator helping answer your questions and responding to your comments during the session. Let's begin today with these wonderful audience comments from our most recent webinar, Climate Change Communication and English Language Teaching with Sheila Maluli. So we have a wonderful comment from Gul'dan in Kazakhstan who wrote, it feels so empowering and special to bring all these great ideas and approaches to the classroom. This will definitely turn English language learning into an exploration of ourselves and the world around us. What a wonderful comment, Gul'dan, thank you so much. And we have Regina in Mexico who writes, I think the activities presented are an ideal starting point to help address climate change issues in the classroom. They are flexible and can be integrated within my school's curricula. Thanks, wonderful comment. Thank you, Regina. And Rahab in Egypt wrote, I like the practical ideas and activities we can utilize to integrate the topic of climate change into our classes. We have to, as we don't have planet B to live on. Wonderful comment, thank you. So we love to see our teacher participants actively engaged in professional development. So please continue to share your thoughts about our webinars by offering feedback through the end of session quiz form or by emailing your thoughts to American English webinars at FHI360.org. We may feature one of your comments during the next session. And throughout series 16, we are exploring the themes of teaching about climate change in the EFL classroom and approaches for teaching a variety of core ELT topics. We hope you are able to use the practical ideas we share. So here's what to expect today. The session is about 60 minutes long. The presenter will present the material and I, as your host, will ask questions and make comments too but we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. Please share your thoughts using the comments feature or chat box. And when our session comes to a close, you will have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the webinar, we'll share a link in the comments. Click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three multiple choice questions correctly. And once you've successfully done so, you should expect to receive your badge via email within about a week. And before we begin, we want to let you know about one of our free massive open online courses, integrating critical thinking skills into the exploration of culture in an EFL setting. This free self-paced course prepares participants to implement cultural and critical thinking lessons. Participants will learn about tools for analyzing, understanding, and negotiating differences between cultures, as well as explore activities for teaching and evaluating culture and critical thinking. Use the link being shared in the comments now to learn more and enroll today. And now for today's webinar, Save the Planet and Cultural Traditions While Teaching English. These days, scientists frequently share dire climate change findings, and the media covers severe weather events that can be attributed to global warming. An equally important and often underreported aspect of the crisis is the loss of cultural traditions. For example, if a drought-stricken area cannot support a community, the people disperse and leave behind place-based traditions. As teachers, our job is to educate our students and prepare them for success during and after their formal education. This webinar will examine our role as English teachers in preparing students to develop ways to slow or change the course of the current climate crisis. First, we will define environmental education and describe how it is integrated into EFL curriculum and textbooks. Next, we will explore educators' readiness to teach this topic and determine what professional development gaps may exist. Finally, we will focus on the local aspects of ecological challenges, including strategies to help students identify issues in their communities, making this topic more personally relevant. And now we're pleased to introduce our presenter, Melissa Hauke. 
Melissa, an Ohio native but Northern Virginia resident, is an ESOL support teacher at West Potomac Academy in Alexandria, Virginia. In this role, she supports health sciences students. She is a career educator with over 25 years of experience teaching young learners, teenagers, and adults. She is a returned Peace Corps volunteer from Mas in, where she served in Macedonia, was a US Department of State English Language Fellow in Russia, and was an English Language Specialist in Thailand. She is a member of the TESOL Standards Professional Council and a TESOL Grant and Proposals Reviewer. Melissa is currently serving a two-year term as Vice President for Washington Area TESOL. Her current professional interest is adult education, and she has recently finished her coursework for an adult education certificate. Her personal interests include reading, traveling, biking, and volunteering. Welcome, Melissa. It's wonderful to have you here with us today. Well, thank you, Kate, for that introduction. Um, I'm excited to be with you today as we examine how to teach environmental education while remembering important cultural traditions. So before we get started, I'm curious how you feel about the overall health of the world. And maybe one of these statements describes you. Seems rather hopeless, we're doomed. Um, I'm not worried, it's just the normal cycle of things. Or things seem bad, but we can turn things around. So um, I'm curious how you feel. Maybe you can put that, your feelings in the chat box. Yeah, what do you think everybody? How do you feel about the overall health of the world? Yes, you can choose one or you can make your own statement. It looks like Nala and Anna and Irina um, all agree and Anastasia agree that things seem bad, but we can turn things around. What else do you think everybody? What are some other ideas that you have? What, are, what do you, or how do you feel about the overall health of the world? You can feel free to write your own sentence or you can also, um, choose one of the options. All right, well, I have to say for myself that I often have, uh, I feel sad about it and sometimes I even feel a little bit hopeless, but uh, I think I agree with most of you here who are, who are making comments that things do seem bad, but we can turn things around if we all work together and do it now. <laughs> yes, I, I think I'm like you, Kate. Um, you know, sometimes I feel that way too. But I, I'm I'm very excited that everyone seems so hopeful. So here are some of my thoughts. Um, as I was starting to say, um, I think sometimes I do feel a little hopeless when I'm reading the news, and it's always such bad news. It seems like. This particular um, um, report that said that 2022 was the Earth's fifth hottest on record, right? That didn't seem too positive to me. And then I have people telling me that it's just the natural cycle of the planet. And maybe they're right. We haven't been keeping records since the beginning of time, so we don't really know. Um, but I feel hopeful because we now have the knowledge and the ability to improve the future of our planet. But I think that overall, we should try to ensure that while we live through this period, that we try to make sure that everyone has their basic human rights met. And that would be fresh drinking water, food, and shelter. And I also know that a lot of people in the world don't have that now, but it is something that we should aspire to. All right, well, what are we going to do today? Well, we're going to review environmental education and its integration into curriculum, textbooks, and educators training. We're going to define place-based learning and discuss its benefits. We'll identify environmental issues and ways to encourage action, and then examine some local environmental challenges that threaten cultural traditions and how to address those problems. So what is environmental education? Well, environmental education is a process that allows for exploration of environmental issues, 
promotes a belief that by taking action, you can make a difference and introduces positive changes that will improve the environment and the planet. Now, there are three things that I like about this definition. First, it's a process. So that means we don't have to know everything today. Second, that by taking action, and that's any action, we can make a difference. And third, these differences will improve the environment and the planet. So what that says to me is that if I go into a restaurant and choose not to get a straw in my drink, then um, I'm, making, I'm taking an action that will make a difference because I'm using less plastic and that will be a good thing for the environment and the planet. As I began to think about this topic of environmental education, I was curious as to um, what it looks like around the world. And so I did some research and um, I found some information about how different countries are um, integrating environmental education into their curriculum and textbooks. So I found that a lot of countries have environmental awareness. So that's good. People know that we've got some problems and they're aware of that. Um, aside from that, what was going on wasn't so much. Um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of curriculum or materials devoted to environmental education. So there is a place where we could change some things and make a difference, I think. So I thought, well, where and how could we integrate environmental education into our textbooks? So you'll notice with the activities that I'm suggesting today, I'm um, really looking at these productive skills, the speaking and the writing. And I think we know that our students always need practice with their speaking. Um, and then I thought, well, thinking about your textbooks that you do have, what, where could you put environmental education? So whether was a first thought for me, and then animals, because we can see that as the climate is changing, animals are losing their habitats and they're being put at risk and becoming endangered and extinct. Um, food is another area where we see um, flooding might be affecting um, our crops and food availability. Geography, we'd like to see where these places are that are um, having extreme problems with climate change. Jobs would be another place because some jobs will go away because of our climate situation, but new jobs will come about as we try to um, meet the needs of our planet. And then sports, uh, maybe, I, I'm not sure, but I, it crossed my mind. But then, of course, health, um, our health it depends, our health um, is often dependent on how, are the health of our environment as well. It can make us sick or healthy. Well, let's stop and reflect. What challenges might you face in teaching environmental education in your classroom? If you go to teach, do you have anything that keeps you from teaching environmental education? Yeah, let us know. Thanks for sharing a lot of your ideas about where people could add it or that sort of thing. But what challenges might you face everybody? when trying to teach environmental education in your classroom. And Francis agrees that units like weather and animals are appropriate to teach about it, great. What challenges might you face? I know there's a big one that I'm expecting to see from a few of you, which is the, the age old issue for all teachers, which is that time issue. Uh, it's always hard to fit everything in that you want to. Miguel says lack of knowledge. Absolutely. Miha says not having enough material. Claudia says maybe lack of student interest. Lack of vocabulary. Nala says the main concern for pre-service teachers is knowledge about the issue. Absolutely. Sadia says planning might be a challenge. And um, a few other people who are saying that um, it uh, it's, might be difficult to plan as well. Thanks, everyone. Well, I think for myself, um, a challenge that I have is that I haven't had any um, formal training in this. 
just what I've been able to do on my own, self-directed learning workshops that I find, um, sort of like this one, or reading the newspaper, listening to the news, or watching um, documentaries. So your answers are reflective of the research that I found on what were some obstacles to teaching environmental education. So there was the lack of subject knowledge of ecology and the environment and preservation of the environment. So some of you said just not having that content knowledge. Also, there was a lack of formal preparation for pre-service or in-service teachers to teach environmental education with innovative and engaging strategies. Right? So we want, we want to teach it, but we're not really sure how to teach it so our students will um, be interested. Then we might have a lack of support. I don't think anybody mentioned this one, but a lack of support from your administrators or the parents to incorporate environmental education into their lessons and curriculum. Um, I mentioned to my supervisor yesterday that I was going to do the seminar, seminar today on um, environmental education and she just sort of laughed like she didn't think it was, I don't know, that it was a serious topic or something, but I told her I was really interested in this. Um, and our parents also, sometimes the parents only, you know, they really want you to focus on the basics like math and reading and writing and not to worry about things that seem not that important, but I think we're seeing that environment, environmental problems are important. Some of you mentioned a lack of curriculum or textbooks, right? So this is a problem as well. And then um, this lack of time, right? Um, I think we we can all know, we, I think everybody agrees that teachers don't have enough time to do what we need to do and then to try to like add on. So if you wanted to create a curriculum with your colleagues at your school, it would take time. Then you would have to find time to write those lessons and then time to create the materials. So that's a lot of extra time. And then you still want to get some rest and take exercise and spend time with your family. So it's, it's, it's a problem, I think. Yeah, and actually we have some really interesting comments that came in as you were sharing these. Um, Nala wrote, in my country, some environmental awareness topics are covered, but there's nothing that's practical or action-based, which I thought was a great comment. Um, and Doreen said, I live in a community where some parents make their living from firewood and charcoal, charcoal. So she has to be careful about how she addresses that issue in the classroom. That's a great point. And one more comment is a big, uh, big challenge in my country is that there are certain cultural procedures that are not in favor of protecting the environment. So those are some wonderful comments. We had one question from Jessam, which I think she's in, uh, he or she is in luck. How can we overcome these challenges as educators? Well, you're about to find out some great practical strategies that you can use in your classroom. That was a great question. All right, go for it, Melissa. So today, um, we're gonna look at this, a uh, one approach that we can use for teaching environmental education, which is place-based learning. So what is place-based learning? It's an approach to learning that takes advantage of the local community to create authentic, meaningful, and engaging situations for students to apply their content knowledge. So because environmental experts believe that solving current environmental problems begins at home, all my ideas today will utilize this place-based learning strategy. Some of those in principle, some of those principles include community as a classroom. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the classroom isn't just a room in the building. Local places and local experts become part of your classroom. Learner centered. So this means it's relevant to the students. It's motivating them as they learn. Inquiry based. So students ask questions make predictions and collect data to understand the world around them. And then local to global. So what students learn about their own community helps them to better understand the environmental problems that the rest of the world faces. 
And one last thing I would like to say here before we go any further is that you are the expert in your area of the world. I'm providing examples of environmental and cultural issues in different places in the world that may guide you on your journey. So we're going to look now as identifying some environmental issues and then ways to encourage action because environmental education, it does want us to take action. So my first activity is a warm up speaking activity, something you would do at the beginning of your class that first 10 or 15 minutes. And in this particular activity, you would do it for a week, we would say. The purpose of the activity is to help students move from awareness to action. As we showed from our textbook exploration that many students know, have an awareness of environmental problems, but they don't really know how to apply what they know. So we wanna help them with that. Um, one thing I'm thinking as far as the frequency for this, you might be, do this at the very beginning of the year and just in general about environmental issues. And then you could then repeat it at the beginning of each unit that you're going to integrate it into and be more specific with it. I think all students could do this activity. And then uh, your skills would be speaking, climate change vocabulary, some teamwork and problem solving. So on the first day, as the class, you would make a list of what you know about the environment and climate change and discuss this in small groups. So you're just activating that awareness that they already have. On the second day, you or one of your students would pick an item from the list, and then the students could work in small groups to decide where in their community they see this problem. So this is this place-based learning. We're bringing it local. Where in their community do they see the problem? So I'm wondering now what environmental topic you would have your students discuss. Yeah, let us know everybody for this warm up speaking activity, which is a great way to integrate um, this topic into your daily routines. What environmental topics would you have your students discuss? Let us know. We saw a lot of great ideas in the Mentimeter poll at the beginning that might be something that you were uh, would talk with them about, like deforestation or um, lack of water or flooding or that sort of thing. But what are some environmental topics that you would have your students discuss? Anastasia says we discuss recycling and how to save water and energy. Great. We uh, maybe the topic of shorting shortage of clean drinking water from Val Valentina. Flood catastrophes from Abacar. Environmental changes and the bad effects of those from Mavish. Soil erosion from Samina land use from Nala, climate change from Jackie, and food waste from Miriam. Wonderful. Thank you for those great topics, everyone. So many ideas. Wow. All right. Well, then on the third day, working in those same groups, the students are going to strategize how to change the situation, right? We want them now to take action. So they've identified a problem, they see where it is in their community, and how are they going to take an action to change that. And then on the fourth day, we'll have this, you'd want the groups to present their ideas in short two to three minute presentations of some sort. So these were my ideas of what your students might come up with. So group one might say, well, we see plastic bags at the supermarket. And so their action would be to take a reusable bag instead of getting a plastic bag and then telling their friends to do the same thing. Another group might say that um, they see people drinking out of those little water, little plastic water bottles. And so one thing that they might do for action is to stop using those and to carry their own reusable water bottle with them. Now, how would we want our students to present their information? So I'm thinking, well, of course, they could make a poster. 
um, they could write and perform a short skit. So I was thinking for this one, maybe they're at the supermarket and um, but the checkout, the person at the checkout asked them if they want a plastic bag and they know I have my reusable bag or maybe they make a video either of this or something else. This would be an easy um, way activity to adapt for your online class. Just have the students work in breakout rooms and then they could work on a collaborative document and then post that um, a short video for the whole class to view. So what ideas do you have for presentations for this speaking activity? Yeah, Melissa shared some ideas that groups could do. What do you think? What ideas do you have for presentations? How do you how would you have your students present their ideas in class? There are so many different ways. Melissa shared a few of them. How would you or have you had students share their ideas for presentations? Oh, Anastasia says make a small newspaper. What a great idea. Daniela says dramatization or role play. Great. What other ideas do you have? Making brochures about how to be eco-friendly, great. Comic stories from Valentina, definitely. Students could create videos from Jessam. PowerPoint presentations from Andrea. They could do debates with Karen, uh, says Karen. Uh, they could use PowerPoints and role plays from Sadia. They could draw pictures. And um, other folks also saying videos and PowerPoint. Smith says article writing and doing some real action like collecting batteries or plastic caps. Wonderful ideas, everybody. Thanks so much. Those are all wonderful. Um, and I see someone wrote um, about interviewing members of the community. That's also a great idea. They're wonderful. So my second activity is similar to the first one um, in that we're encouraging the students to take action, right? So we're moving those students from awareness to action. And this would be a project. So it could be done in class or you might give it for homework. Um, and I'm thinking maybe 20 minutes each day of a class for four or five days. Um, 20 minutes is usually a good amount of time to let students work on something. And, and of course, it would depend on your students' ages and their abilities to work independently as well. Um, you could assign it for homework, but I don't, I often have trouble getting my students to return their homework. So I would probably just do this in class. Um, and they could work independently or with a partner. And I think, again, this is suitable for all levels of your speakers. So the everyday action research project, what, what are the instructions? Well, first they choose a topic and this is a, is a non-environmental topic, it has nothing really to do with the environment, their topic. It could be about cars, it could be about their favorite sport. Um, and then what they do after they choose their topic is find a related environmental issue. And then they decide on some action steps. So it is important that the students are specific about their topic and the actions that they will take. This is how we will see change because they're being specific. So I've given my example is my topic would be crochet because I like to crochet. And when I thought about that, at first I didn't think there could be an environmental issue, but then I thought, well, what about yarn production? I think yarn is probably produced, mass produced in a factory somewhere in the world. Um, so maybe, and it's a far away place, so it, they have to put it on a plane to fly it to me and then maybe on a truck to get it to me. I don't, it's, it's a lot of like movement with this yarn. So I thought, well, what if I started using yarns from locally sourced yarn shops? So one of my colleagues at school just um, told me last week that he knows some local yarn shops that have some really beautiful yarns. So now I could start um, buying their yarns, which would then um, promote local business as well as help the environment. So how do you think your students would benefit from doing this activity? Yeah, I love this activity, really showing or really having students um, be involved by 
starting with what they're interested in or something that they like to do. So what do you think, everybody? How would your students benefit from doing this type of activity? What do you think? Well, I kind of gave my answer away by saying that I it starts with student interest. So I think that we saw a lot of people saying there might be lack of motivation for students to talk about this. But if we start with something they're interested in, interested in we know that that always increases motivation and buy-in um, of this type of stuff. Franklin said students could record podcasts. Wow, really great idea. Um, let's see. How else could it benefit? They could have, um, they can reflect uh, on the solutions for protecting the environment. They can become more aware of what's happening that, around them from ARENA. They will find it interesting. They will come up with wonderful solutions. So those problem solving skills and critical thinking skills. Um, we saw one person who said she also likes to crochet and it will also improve their communication skills. Wonderful, thanks everyone. Wonderful ideas. And yes, I think the students will be motivated to take some action. Okay, we are now ready to examine some local environmental challenges that threaten cultural traditions and how to address those problems. But before we look at local problems, we need to consider biodiversity. So what is biodiversity? Well, that is all the different kinds of life in one area. So I'm going to give an example of what happens uh, when biodiversity gets out of balance. So if, if, if biodiversity is in balance, that means everything's functioning as it should. Now here where I live near Washington, DC, in the fall, birds migrate or move to the south. And then in the spring, they migrate back north. And when they get here, right, they mate, they make their nests and they start raising their young. And then when the birds arrive, right, the trees are in leaf, there's caterpillars out on the leaves, eating the leaves. And then the birds have a food source for their babies. So that's what, when biodiversity is working like it should, that's what happens. But when biodiversity gets out of balance, then we come into some problems. So if the winter is warm, and here in where I live, the winter seemed to be getting warmer earlier. We haven't even had snow yet, and it's February. Um, so if the winter is warm, the tree's leaves appear earlier, which means the caterpillars will hatch earlier and become butterflies sooner. And when they're butterflies, they fly away. And then when the birds arrive, there won't be enough food for their babies, right? The birds didn't know that it was warm up north and that the leaves came out sooner. They don't know this, so they come back at their regular time. And then when they get here, there's no food for their babies. So the bird population will begin to decrease. And that, or the birds will fly and migrate to another place, which is another issue. But let's say they begin to decrease, well, this is a problem because birds eat insects and fewer birds need more insects. And insects eat our crops like corn and wheat and rice. And so that means then less food for people. So I, I think uh, while it's true that we need to try to stop climate change, we also need to be aware of how interdependent all living things are in an area. So with that in mind, I have another activity, which is biodiversity and environmental problems. So this is to help students consider how all living things are connected and depend on each other. So you could do this um, over two class periods of 30 minutes, or if you had the time, you could do it in an hour, I think. Again, all levels with appropriate scaffolding, and then your skills, speaking, writing, you're gonna be looking at some compare and contrast, prediction, which um, is part of that place-based learning, the um, inquiry-based inquiry mind, and the climate change vocabulary. So in this activity, you're going to brainstorm a list of environmental issues and create a worksheet. So you can see I have four there, flooding, habitat loss for animals, light pollution, and extreme heat. And then across the top for my columns, I have who does this affect or what? So in my example, it was 
the birds were affected by um, the trees by it being a warm winter. And it was a regional issue. It happens all over this area where I live. And then why should I care? Well, ultimately it might mean there'll be less food available. So that could be a big problem. So as you do this worksheet, I'm thinking the first example you would do with the whole class. So everybody sort of understands. And then I would let the students work with a partner to complete the worksheet. So I'm going to ask Kate if she would do the first one on flooding for us so everybody can see what it would look like. Sure. Yeah, so when I um, think about the uh, flooding issue and who it affects or what, um, I, I mentioned this in the two weeks ago in the webinar too, but the flooding that was recently happening here in the United States and California affected some of my family members. So it affects people who live in those areas. It might affect their housing. It might affect their food. It might affect their water quality. There's so much that it affects. Uh, it might affect where they're able to live. They might have to move. Um, and it is, it starts as sort of a local or regional problem, but especially if flooding causes issues to crops or plant sources, that might affect how we can, how farmers can share that food across the country or even across the world. Um, so it could even be a global problem and might even lead to food shortage. Well, and why should we care? I think it's a, uh, easy to see, we need to make sure that we are protecting the people that uh, people around the world so that they can have home security and also um, those global issues of food scarcity might be affected as well or water quality. So that's what I would say for the flooding topic. All right, Kate, thank you. Yes, I, I would agree with you on that. All right. So as we continue on with this activity, um, the students would choose one of the issues to illustrate after they've completed their worksheet. And they will design two pictures, one that shows biodiversity and trouble, and the second one will re reflect biodiversity and balance, where everything is what we would like it to be. And the students will write about their illustrations. They might use the uh, if then sentence construction, right? So doing a little predicting, maybe some compare and contrast. Someone um, I think mentioned cause and effect as well. So these are all good higher order thinking. And then we want our students to share what they've come up with. So I thought a gallery walk would be a good idea where the students put out their, um, their posters and then the students walk around and leave, um, leave notes, specific um, comments on the response the responses. I see someone mentioning conditionals. Yes, I agree. It would be conditional too. Um, so for scaffolding and adaptations, um, I think the chart could have several answers supplied for those more limited English speakers. And for the ones who are more advanced, you could just leave the chart blank. Um, I think pictures would be good for your limited speakers um, for the issues as well as the column headings. And as far as responding, I think the students who are a little more capable with their English could use descriptive language with their responses. And this would be also an easy activity to adapt for online. Again, putting those students in their breakout rooms with their collaborative documents. And then um, when they're finished, each pair could share and the students could write their responses in the chat box. All right, well, let's stop and reflect. What is an issue that you're in your community that affects its biodiversity? Yeah, let us know everybody. What is an issue in your community that affects its biodiversity? Please let us know in the chat. So I live not too far from Melissa in Maryland and we have the Chesapeake Bay, which is close to the Atlantic Ocean. And the, the damage that's been done, unfortunately, to the water there and the wetlands there has definitely affected the biodiversity that can live there. So just from water pollution um, and from overuse, things like that. How about you, everybody? What are some issues in your community that affect biodiversity? 
Daniela says drought has affected biodiversity. Pollution from Lulia. What are some other ones? Adele also says pollution. Many people throw garbage into the river in the city. That's too bad from Francis. Uh, let's see, garbage is not disposed of properly from Sadia. Rania also says mostly droughts for them. Where I live, <laughs> our dear moderator, Heather, who lives in Alaska, glaciers melting and polar ice melting, absolutely. Very, very serious. Heat mm -hmm. strokes in the summer, um, overpopulation, people without education from Juan Pablo, poor sanitary conditions from Atha, um, and oil spills from Miss Lourdes. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. Definitely some very serious issues affecting your communities. Yes, and yes, I it's what a what a I'm really amazed at all the topics that are coming up here, Kate, and really makes me glad that we're doing this um, some, this webinar today. All right, well, we're ready now to move into solving a local or regional environmental and cultural issue. So now we want students to consider how environmental problems can affect local traditions and cultures. So I thought for this particular activity, um, your unit on food would be a good place to integrate this. And I think, again, all levels of students with appropriate scaffolding could do it. Your younger students might need some assistance from parents or other adults in your community. You would work, um, your skills would be speaking, letter writing, um, problem solving, teamwork, food specific vocabulary, and some climate change vocabulary. So in this particular one, I was reading the newspaper back in the fall, and I read an article about how there was a cabbage shortage in South Korea. And it, it immediately piqued my interest and I wanted to read about it. And I learned a lot of things from this. So and my idea for this is you would present the students with the background information about this issue. So what I found was that due to extreme temperatures and heavy rains, there's less cabbage. And I learned that kimchi is made with fermented cabbage and eaten about seven times a week. So I learned that kimchi is an important food in Koreans' diets, right? It's like a staple for them. I also learned that making kimchi is a family activity and central to Korean and cultural, to Korean cultural heritage. So it's an important food for them, not just because they eat it all the time, but because of the cultural traditions that go with it. And then I learned that farmers might need to raise a different crop like apples, which has nothing to do with their culture at all. It would be something that would be lost, I think. So you would present that information and then you would ask the students to develop ideas to address the cabbage shortage in South Korea. So, they might say, well, we could have a school garden where we could grow cabbage. Maybe we should work with a farmer since we're not really sure how to raise a garden. Um, they could work with someone who makes kimchi so they could learn how to make it for their school and maybe serve it at lunch. And then maybe they should educate their community to build that awareness of the issue and then work collectively with the community to take action. Now, the first step for doing this activity would be to write a letter or prepare a presentation for the school administration so they could get permission to have a school garden to grow cabbage and then the other vegetables that go with making kimchi. Second step is if they get that permission, um, then they would need to contact their local experts. So remember place-based learning. So their local experts in their community who could assist with designing and planting a garden. So they would need to know how big of a garden and what to plant and then how to take care of it. Step three, once they have their first harvest of cabbage and other vegetables, um, they will learn how to make kimchi. Now, I don't know how long it takes for cabbage to grow because I'm not a gardener, but um, your local expert would know that and they could help, right? And then they could make the kimchi. And then last, they would want to develop public service announcements, which are short student creative videos um, to make their community aware of what they're doing 
And then maybe their community would want to be involved too. So for extensions and variations, um, I realize it might be impossible to have a garden at your school, but the students could still work through the steps of the process to figure out how to do it. They might also um, reach out to the local government to see if they could have a community garden and then more people could be involved with, their, with this idea. And then last, um, they could learn about the history of this important food. Maybe they don't really know how this food became to be so important to them. And you could bring in again, that local expert who could share that information. <laughs> All right, so I just read that it takes about six months for cabbage to grow. So you're, you could, this could be an all-year project maybe. So how would you adapt this activity for your context? Yes, definitely, thank you. Um, and we had another comment from a participant in Korea, Jehu, who says family members gather to make kimchi. And so definitely it's an important practice. Thank you for sharing that, yep. Um, how would you adapt this activity that Melissa has shared for your context? Um, one comment we received was that Cobra said um, they do a lot of teamwork uh, activities in his classroom. Students enthusiastically work on the topic of climate change and they record videos. So that is great. It helps them with their vocabulary, writing and speaking skills. Wonderful. What are some adaptations that you might do? Let's see, Sonia says, we practice it in our school and mark the specific area for students. They could do, um, they could give awareness to the community through social media. Great idea. You could do a social media campaign with this. You could create a green area in the school. What a nice idea from Miss Lourdes. You could do awareness sessions. I love that idea. Trying to bring more awareness for your school. Forming a social club from ISA. Project work from John G. And Atha says in Pakistan, they do an awareness campaign about wheat. So that's really interesting. Thanks so much for sharing that. And so many other great ideas coming in. Thanks, everybody. Well, wonderful. Sounds great. I love the green, green area at your school. I always use lots of green area. All right, my last activity is um, making art to promote the environment. So again, here we are helping students consider how environmental problems can affect local traditions and culture. And I thought you could integrate this one into your geography or your jobs unit. I think all levels of this of your speakers would be could do this with the appropriate scaffolding. And then we've got speaking and writing. This time you might have scripts or lyrics if they're writing songs, problem solving, teamwork, art specific vocabulary, and then again, the climate change vocabulary. So why do you want to use art? Well, it allows a more emotional perspective of the issue instead of just the facts and science. Um, when we see that animals are becoming extinct or endangered or we're losing plants, you know, this is really sad. So it's this emotional um, reaction to climate change. Um, art provides multiple ways to express ourselves. So art can be visual, performance, and musical, which gives students many ways to express their ideas. And then students can employ an innovative way to provide community education. We don't really think about art when we're talking about um, environmental education. So it's innovative and unexpected. So your turn. I'm curious, how do you integrate art into your lessons? Yes, let us know, everybody. We know that a lot of you use art in your classrooms every day. Please let us know how you integrate art into your classrooms and lessons. Farida says they do a photo gallery on a green city. What a wonderful idea. I love that. Um, let's see. You can do a photo campaign or an art campaign to let the students find ways to spread awareness about climate change. Great. Oh, you could do online museum walks. I love that idea. You could create comics, posters, panels, and mural, murals, even graffiti. Absolutely. 
draw for how, maybe make sure where the graffiti is is a good place <laughs> draw for how these how they see the earth now from sadia creating poetry drawing and skits posters on the bulletin board you could do little box theater for younger students pictorial presentations posters poster competitions flashcards writing poems and songs encouraging role play wow so many great creative ideas, everyone. Thank you for sharing. Yes, it's it's really, really wonderful. All your ideas makes me very excited, very excited. All right, so here's my here's my activity for this one. So the lots of birch bark from paper birch trees. So again, I was reading the newspaper and I came across this article. And I will say that I didn't know there was such a thing as a paper birch tree. So I was I learned a lot by reading this. So in this one, in your first day, you're going to bring in a guest speaker, again, your local expert, or perhaps it's you who will give a presentation on the paper birch tree. And it's important to indigenous or these first nation people of your country. And the presentation would include the following information. Um, due to environmental issues and the effects of climate change, paper birch trees are losing their birch bark. So this is a regional problem. And then the indigenous cultures use the birch bark in their sacred rituals and fires to make medicines, um, to weave baskets, make canoes, as a canvas for storytelling and pictures. And then by making all these things, it was also a financial uh, resource for them because they could sell things to others. The, my activity plan would be for the first day to bring in your guest speaker to give that presentation. On days two and three, having students work in small groups and choose one of those purposes um, of the paper birch tree, and then do some research on that. The next days, and again, this is sort of fluid depending on how you would like, uh, how much time you would like to give to it, but giving the students um, that time to explore and create their preferred art form to express their knowledge and feelings about the tree. And then I think once you make art, you need to be able to display that art. So you'd want to have an event where they could display and perform their art for their school and or their community. And then the last day would be their event day when they would actually do that. And even if you couldn't have a large, um, event. You could still have something even in your classroom or within your school, I would think. So we have now covered all of the things that we had hoped to cover, defining environmental education, looking at um, the benefits of place-based learning, learning how to move from awareness to action, and then seeing how um, the environment can threaten some cultural traditions and what we can do to address those problems. So one last reflection, what strategy for teaching environmental education would you like to try tomorrow with your class? Yeah, let us know everybody, what strategy for teaching environmental education would you like to try in your class? Let's see. We have some ideas from the webinar and some ideas that I think were sparked by the webinar. Sonia says we can build birdhouses on trees with kids and express our artwork with different shapes. What a great idea. Naila says they want to make a comic strip. Adele says they're going to do an art competition. Wonderful. What other ideas and strategies are you going to use? I really like the warm up activity idea and the approach of place based education. And I also really like the graphic organizer you shared. Debate on priorities, story talk, do an art exhibition or role play, poster making, story talk and art, place based learning from Fatu. Wonderful. Very good. Well, I see that you are all ready to implement some of these great strategies into your class uh, very soon. So thanks everyone. Well, um, and I, I really appreciate all of your great ideas that you've shared with each other and, um, and with me. I've enjoyed myself today and um, I just encourage you the next time that you're doing something to think about what small action you can take 
um, to make the environment better. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, I have I definitely feel inspired, and I can tell that many of our participants feel inspired as well to integrate climate change and saving cultural tradition topics into our classrooms or in, into our daily lives and how we think and approach this topic. So thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Lots of thank yous coming in from our audience too.